Hello everyone and welcome back to our second episode of the German Classic Prize podcast exploring the Judenbuche by Annette von droste hülshoff I'm Natasha, a fourth year default student here at Jesus College Oxford and the German Classic Prize coordinator. Today we are at the lovely St. Edmunds Hall College in Oxford and as you remember in our first episode we talked about various aspects uh, such as the crime story character of the Judenbuche and how the narrative likes to lead us astray. Our guest today is Dr. Joanna Reisbeck, and she's going to talk about the Judenbuche and Homer's The Odyssey. Hello, my name is Joanna Reisbeck. I'm a lecturer in German at St. Hilda's College here at the University of Oxford. What I'd like to discuss in this short lecture are some particular features of Annette von Droster Hülshoff's 1842 novella Die Judenbuche, The Jew's Beach. The novella is in many ways a crime story or a detective story, one that is full of ambiguity and apparent false leads that make it challenging to interpret. But alongside the detail we have of Friedrich Mergel's life story and that of his peculiar double or doppelgänger in Johannes Niemand, we also have themes of the economic exploitation of natural resources, criminality and the question of anti-Semitism. But I'd like to look at something different. And specifically, I'd like to look at how we might be able to understand Die Judenbuche by comparing it to one of the most well-known texts in European literature, and that's Homer's classical epic, The Odyssey. This may seem to be a surprising comparison, but there are good reasons to suspect a connection between the two texts. Partly, this is because no literary text exists in a vacuum, Writers and readers are always conscious of the cultural traditions and knowledge that they are working in and with. So a literary text doesn't just exist as a self-contained plot or set of characters, but can also make manifest a collective cultural and literary consciousness. For this reason, we might find ourselves in the present day knowing the phrase to be or not to be is from Shakespeare's Hamlet, We have a collective awareness of famous quotations, characters, narratives, and even plot twists from literature and film. So what this means is that there's a certain expectation that readers have an awareness of particularly particular literary or cultural traditions. And this can happen without us ever having read that novel or watched a film in question. What I'd like to explore in this lecture is how the narrative of Die Judenbuche is complemented by a series of intertextual allusions to the Odyssey, and what this means for how we might understand and interpret the novella. So in the first instance, I'd like to talk you through what intertextuality is. Then I'll introduce the Odyssey and show how it functions as an intertext for Die Judenbuche. The term intertextuality has a variety of different meanings in literary theory and is most commonly associated with the literary critic Julia Kristeva, who coined the term. What I am using it to mean here is how we can read literature through the allusions and references that are made to other literary texts. To consider why this might be important and why this might be fruitful, Let me quote from the critic Roland Barthes, who is most famous for his 1967 essay, The Death of the Author. Now, although he doesn't use the term intertextuality per se, he's interested in how texts relate to one another. And this is a quotation that you'll find on the PowerPoint. We know now that a text is not a line of words releasing a single theological meaning, the message of the author God, but a multidimensional space in which a variety of writings, none of them original, blend and clash. The text is a tissue of quotations drawn from the innumerable centers of culture. The writer can only imitate a gesture that is always anterior, never original. His only power is to mix writings, to counter the ones with the others, in such a way as to never to rest on any one of them. Did he wish to express himself, he ought at least to know that the inner thing he thinks to translate is only a ready-formed dictionary, its words only explainable through other words, and so on indefinitely. 
There are a few important points to draw from this. Firstly, Barth is claiming that there is no singular or final meaning of a literary text, and certainly no hidden message that was originally intended or placed there by the author for an interpreter or critic to uncover. So here, with the idea of the author God, Barth is playing on the overlap and etymological link between the idea of the author and the idea of authority. So in a way, this is an argument for there being no authoritative or final interpretation of a text. But for our purposes, what's most interesting about this quotation is the idea that a text is a tissue of quotations drawn from the innumerable centres of culture. It continues the dismantling of the idea of a singular creative authority in the author, but Barth then proceeds to emphasise how literary texts exist in and are intimately bound up with a system of language and culture. Now, this idea doesn't tell us how to interpret texts, but rather what Barth is doing is offering a way of looking at literature as an interacting and interlocking system and finding ways in which texts productively borrow from collective materials rather than an author striving always for complete originality. So with all this in mind, let me introduce the Odyssey. The Odyssey is composed of 24 books. It's one of two epic poems in ancient Greek attributed to Homer, and one of the foundational works of literature in the European canon. It details the events that before Odysseus, after the fall of Troy. Odysseus was the Greek king of the island of Ithaca, a potentially mythical island. He spent 10 years at the siege of Troy during the wars there. He was known for his cunning and his sharp intelligence. We might say that he was something of a schemer if we're being less charitable. Odysseus is credited with coming up with the idea of the Trojan horse, which brought Troy's downfall. Odysseus's return home as narrated in the Odyssey is eventful to say the least. It takes him 10 years to make the journey home, and along the way on one island, for example, he and his men are captured by the Cyclops Polyphemus, but manage to escape. Odysseus blinds the Cyclops. On another island, half of Odysseus's men are turned into pigs by Circe, a goddess who is also a witch, but she falls in love with him and then lets his men go. He and his men also survive an encounter with the sirens, whose alluring voices otherwise lead sailors to their certain doom. Odysseus does eventually reach Ithaca, where he finds his wife Penelope and his son Telemachus, effectively besieged by the suitors who have flocked to Ithaca in the preceding years to court Penelope in her husband's absence. What is important is that Odysseus is not recognised on Ithaca upon his initial return apart from by his faithful dog, Argos, and also by his wet nurse, Eurycleia. And this allows him eventually to prove his identity to his wife, and after he has slaughtered all the suitors who are trying to win his wife's affections, he is then happily reunited with his wife and son. So that's a brief look through the Odyssey. It's a terrific adventure, but there are a few things to emphasise that offer commonalities with Die Judenbuche, even if they appear to be quite different texts on the surface. Both texts are interested in questions of identity. We have two recognition scenes that are discussed in Die Judenbuche, both of which make reference to the Odyssey. There is also the attendant question of an individual's journey home and the status of an individual in society as a potential outsider, as Odysseus is initially upon his return to Ithaca. But where Odysseus may be favourably portrayed for his guile and mendacity in his attempts to return home and in his vengeance plot to rid his home of the suitors, this is not the case in Die Judenbuche. Friedrich Mergel and others, like Johannes Niemand and Simon Semmler, are presented as morally problematic because of their mendacity and also their downright criminality. I'd like to suggest that the relationship between the Judenbuche and the Odyssey isn't a linear one. We're not just moving from the praised classical hero in Odysseus to a lower class and poor son of an alcoholic in Friedrich Mergel. 
I'm going to talk about a disparity between the texts, but actually we can see the ways in which the Judenbuche might reflect back on the Odyssey as well and make us question Odysseus's actions as a heroic character. So to turn to the Judenbuche itself. The Judenbuche is a novella that devotes close attention to the specifics of its rural setting in Westphalia, which was also Droste Hülshoff's home. So it seems curious for it to have the Odyssey as its primary intertext, which is concerned with a laborious journey home. But if we place these narratives alongside one another, and indeed look at the very first allusion to the Odyssey in the novella, we can see how Droste Hülshoff creates a moment of almost hidden anticipation in the opening paragraph. In fact, the very first reference to the Odyssey rests on the reader knowing what the Latin name of Odysseus is, Ulysses, as in the novel by James Joyce, and also it's the name of a 19th century US president. Now, this use of Ulysses isn't necessarily odd in itself. It would be expected in the 1840s that a reader would know what this means. But the manner of the comparison that's made is itself conspicuous. And I'm coming on to the first quote on the PowerPoint from the Judenbuch. I will read out the German here and you will be able to see the English translation on the PowerPoint. Das Ländchen, dem es angehörte, war damals eine jener abgeschlossenen Erdwinkel ohne Fabriken und Handel, ohne Heerstraßen, wo noch ein fremdes Gesicht Aufsehen erregte und eine Reise von 30 Meilen selbst den Vornehmeren zum Ulysses seiner Gegend machte. So what Droste Hüshoff is doing through this comparison is emphasizing the importance of locality in the novella, the relative lack of travel that people would undergo in this area if they did travel, they may too become as unrecognisable as Odysseus was upon his return to Ithaca. Note too the linguistic elevation that leads into the mention of Ulysses or Odysseus, the idea of a more noble individual in the English translation. That can refer to the individual's character, but it also suggests social hierarchy. Odysseus himself had noble standing. But it's also interesting because it's a comparative. The comparative more noble, Fornimeren, is worthy of closer attention. It's not quite clear who the comparison is being made to. More noble to compare to Friedrich Merger, perhaps, who has already been introduced. Now, it is true that there is a later reference in the novella to Friedrich Merger's clothes being elegant, sort of close to this idea of nobility. But I would like to suggest that this reference here performs a double function. On one level, the conspicuous reference to Homer adds a self-conscious literary element to a novella which has started with the claim that it's telling a true historical story. Indeed, it's a story that's based on historical fact and draws on an account that Droste Hüshoff's uncle wrote about a criminal case at the turn of the 19th century. So immediately with the novella, it is bringing together a tangible historical reality or claims about a historical reality with a literary narrative. This has the effect of alerting us as readers to be attentive to the modulations of the narrative voice, which goes on to note the moral degradation of the village with the, the development of its own system of right and wrong adjacent to the officially sanctioned legal system. How the narrative voice works in the novella is very important, and I would encourage you to note when it is particularly judgmental, when it gives information to the reader, and actually most importantly, when it withholds information from the reader. On another level, this reference to Ulysses or Odysseus acts as a moment of prolepsis. What I mean by this term is that it anticipates the narrative to come. Of the return of Friedrich Merkel, or is it Johannes Niemand to the village, and who has been away for so long to end up being a stranger to the community, just as Odysseus was upon his return to his homeland after the years away, traveling and at Troy. To round off commentary on this section, I'd also like to note how the intertextual allusion here creates a certain ironic disparity between the classical heroic narrative of highborn Odysseus and Roster Hussoff's realist narrative concerned with characters of far lower social class. <laughs> 
The last two examples I'd like to discuss in this lecture are the two recognition scenes that I've already mentioned. In the Odyssey, recognition as a concept is relatively straightforward. Odysseus's loyal hound, Argos, immediately knows who he is, as does Odysseus's former wet nurse, Eurycleia, when she bathes him. Since the reader of the Odyssey has privileged knowledge relative to the characters within the text, there can be no confusion or ambiguity over Odysseus's identity. We always know who Odysseus is. It is more a source then of narrative tension about when his identity will be revealed as the returning king of Ithaca and how his homecoming will resolve the problems of his kingdom. In Homer, then, identity, linked with recognition, is in a sense stable or fixed, and we as readers, or listeners perhaps, have reliable access to the real identity of the protagonist. Groß der Hussos novella is particularly effective in how it moves away from this stable concept of identity and recognition, and instead generates ambiguity about the identity of both Friedrich Merger and Johannes Niemand. This is particularly evident when Johannes Niemand is first introduced. Here, the narrative is focused unusually through the perspective of Margrit, Friedrich's mother, and it follows a night where, for the first time, Friedrich has not returned home and his mother is unreasonably anxious and irritated about her son's absence, that he is not sleeping in the same room as her. That's a mark, too, of their low social standing, that they only have one room to sleep in. And this takes me to the second of three quotations from the Judenbuche. Again, I'll read the German, and you will find the English on the PowerPoint. Als sie wieder in die dunkle Küche trat, stand Friedrich am Herde. Er hatte sich vornüber gebeugt und wärmte die Hände an den Kohlen. Der Schein spielte auf seinen Zügen und gab ihnen ein widriges Ansehen von Magerkeit und ängstlichem Zucken. Margret blieb in der Tennentür stehen, so seltsam verändert kam ihr das Kind vor. Margret stand still. Ihre Blicke wurden ängstlich. Der Knabe erschien ihr wie zusammengeschrumpft. Auch seine Kleider waren nicht dieselben. Nein, das war ihr Kind nicht. Und dennoch, Friedrich, Friedrich, rief sie. This is an uncanny encounter. Note how in the first instance we have a positive identification of the character as Friedrich stand Friedrich am Herde. Now there's been no reason up to this point in the narrative to doubt such an identification. But this turns out to be mistaken, only eventually. Margret picks up on the apparent changes in her son. So seltsam verändert kam ihr das Kind vor. So the initial identification is given through the authority of Margrethe, who presumes to know her son and yet is caught on this boundary between recognition and misrecognition throughout this section. Note, for instance, the faltering syntax of nein, das war ihr Kind nicht und dennoch, with the qualification of what might speak for the boy being Friedrich being left unsaid. The, quote, the reason for Margrethe's confusion, and indeed her double vision, stems from a family resemblance between the two characters. Johannes Niemand is likely the illegitimate son of Simon Semmler, Friedrich's own uncle. What's interesting about this section is how the narrator's voice retreats. It is eventually left to Friedrich Mergel himself to make the positive identification of Johannes. Johannes himself remains difficult for the reader to discern because he does not speak or he's not audible at all and that the first encounter with him is filtered through Marguerite's unsettled attempts to work out who he is after having misidentified him. The name Johannes Niemand is also a primary allusion to the Odyssey here. On one level, the name is a social marker that his father is technically unknown and that no one cares for him, we later learn. So it's a sign that Johannes Niemand exists outside of accepted social structures. His identity is, in a sense, a non-identity or an absence of identity. It's also a reference to the name that Odysseus gives to himself when he tricks the Cyclops Polyphemos, which is a pun in ancient Greek. Odysseus comes up with the name Nemo, which means no one, 
And the ability, the reason why this is important in the Odyssey is the ability to name someone is important. It allows characters to appeal to the gods in the Odyssey and they can then curse an identifiable individual, but they need to have their name in order to do that. So there are certain parallels with questions of identity in the Odyssey, although Odysseus in his haughtiness does actually eventually let his real name slip. The difference with Johannes Niemand is that he, unlike Odysseus, can never be someone in society. His name marks him as someone who is inherently socially ostracized. The function of Johannes Niemand is also distinct in the narrative. It sets up a doubling effect. He is the physically weaker and less socially confident doppelgänger of Friedrich Mergel. They both flee together after the murder of Aaron. The second scene of recognition I'd like to discuss closes the novella, and it appears to indicate that the man who is claimed to be Johannes Niemand, who has returned after 28 years since the death of Aaron, well, he might well be Friedrich Mergu. This man's peregrinations, his travels, could be read as a form of punishment or retribution for his crime. We learn that he served in war and has been enslaved by the Turks. Certainly, the suicide on the Jews' beach would suggest potential guilt in the death of Aaron. But, as with the first recognition scene, what we have again is how Drozdo Hussoff plays with a stable sense of identity, both invoking the idea and undermining any assurance that the dead man could be Friedrich Mergel. It is implied to be him, and certainly the shape of the narrative would suggest it could reasonably be him, but we as readers are not left ever knowing for certain. So this ambiguity is played out through the last reference to the Odyssey. And I am coming then to the final quotation uh, from Die Judenbucher. The first slide has the German on it and the second slide has the English quotation equivalent since it's relatively long. Sie waren unter der Buche angelangt. Ich sehe nichts, sagte der Herr von S. Hierher müssen Sie treten, hierher in dieser Stelle. Wirklich, dem war so. Der Gutsherr erkannte seine eigenen abgetragenen Schuhe. Gott, Es ist Johannes, setzt die Leiter an. So, nun herunter, sacht, sacht, lasst ihn nicht fallen. Lieber Himmel, die Würme sind schon daran. Macht er noch die Schlinge auf und die Halsbinde. Eine breiter Narbe ward sichtbar. Der Gutsherr fuhr zurück. Mein Gott, sagte er. Er beugte sich wieder über die Leiche, betrachtete die Name mit großer Aufmerksamkeit und schwieg eine Weile in tiefer Erschütterung. Dann wandte er sich zu den Förstern. Es ist nicht recht, dass der Unschuldige für den Schuldigen leide. Sagt es nur an den Leuten, der da, er deutete auf den Toten, war Friedrich Mergel. Die Leiche ward auf dem Schindanger verscharrt. This is a very tautly narrated section of the text. The allusion to the Odyssey is in the form of identification. Upon his return to Ithaca, when Odysseus is bathed by his wet nurse Eurycleia, she recognizes him to be Odysseus on the basis of a scar on his thigh. But what's unsettling about the use of the scar as identification in Die Judenbucher is the suddenness of its inclusion. There's no prior mention of Friedrich Mergel ever having a scar, so within the world of the novella's narrative, this detail makes very little sense because it has not been sufficiently motivated or prepared for the reader. It does, however, make sense if we look back to the first allusion that we looked at to Ulysses or Odysseus in the novella's opening paragraph as anticipating the fate of Friedrich and or Johannes. So this is a section that relies on the reader knowing of Odysseus's telltale scar. Yet this illusion could be ironic, or at least it's one that does not yield a stable result or conclusion. First, we are told by the squire, der Gutsherr, that it is Johannes Niemand in the tree. Then he examines the scar and comes out with a biblically inflected statement of Es ist nicht recht, dass der Unschuldige für den Schuldigen leide invoking a sense of guilt, potentially over Aaron's death. But all we then have is the idea that people should be told that the dead man is Friedrich Merge. That is not the same as the dead man being Friedrich. We receive, therefore, no positive identification of who this man might be. Instead, the focus is on the social meaning of the claim, 
that the squire deems it best for it to be known that the dead man was Friedrich. So what we have here is Droster Hushoff refusing the reader the sort of exposition, the sort of explanation that we might expect in a detective or criminal story that would tie up the narrative and provide us as readers with a satisfying and well-rounded conclusion. Critics have proposed differing interpretations for how to read these final lines, whether the body is Friedrich and the death is a retrospective admission of guilt, freeing Johannes from the shame of suicide would also be another motivation for what the squire says. There's really no conclusive answer to the question of how to interpret this section, so I would leave it to you to decide what you think might be going on here. So how do these intertextual allusions to the Odyssey help us understand the Judenbuche? They create a series of associations that are thwarted, such as the idea of a character's identity being stable or a positive recognition of a character being possible. So what Droste Hushoff does through these references is to tie the Odyssey to the central themes of the novella, the problem of securing knowledge about individuals, about the crimes in the novella, and importantly, how to carry out the act of interpretation itself. We as readers have to become detectives when we read this novella. It is not that the interpretation is doomed to fail, given the tensions I've highlighted in the two recognition or maybe misrecognition scenes. Rather, Droster Hushoff is attentive to the difficulties of interpretation. In a novella that proceeds through subtle suggestion and nuance, one that reaches a conclusion that at the same time withholds a firm conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>